Um, the one, I, I love Ruby. I've loved him for years. But the one thing that I sort of chafe at, it could be my issues, but is, is a sense of a kind of an anti, uh, what something could be taken as anti-intellectual, the, the, the challenge to reason. And tell me if I'm incorrect in thinking that perhaps he is addressing a, a, an expression of reason that is really represented by, uh, by medieval scholasticism. And, and is there room in Rumi for, uh, for respect for a more mature reason that knows when to shut up when deeper voices are speaking? I just said I didn't want to be the only one speaking, so Jack will follow on that. I actually think that what he does is that when he gets exposed to Shams and this other side of completely ecstatic side of his life and work comes out, he's completely done with the education. He goes to Aleppo, he goes through the most traditional um, scholastic education that people can take. And if you read the Mass Navi, for example, it's all there. References to theology, philosophy, uh, you know, all kinds of things that you might not even expect him to be, um, to have been exposed to. The way I deal with his intellectual side, or feel about it, is that he doesn't go around it. He does not ignore it. Neither does he ignore religion in the most institutional way. He goes right through it. He has the experience, he acknowledges the experience, but he does not get tied down with that experience. Whether it's reason or is theoretical knowledge, it's there for him to explore another aspect of life, but then he leaves it behind and moves beyond it. And that's the ability that I think makes him so attractive to, have, to, to us. If you ask me, I would say the most dominant characteristic of him is playfulness, subversiveness, and joy. And these are tools that he uses for education. But deep down, he's deeply rooted in the tradition, which is why he can be that playful and that ecstatic, but not really drift, because he's rooted, very deeply rooted, I think, in the tradition. Thank you. <laughs> Coming back to the place of Sufism and its acceptance in mainstream Islam today, I grew up in Indian subcontinent in the part which is Pakistan now. There historically, the Sufi saints played a huge role in spread of Islam in Indian subcontinent. And there are several, what we call Mizar, are their grave sites, the monuments, where people gather annually to celebrate what we call Urs. That's where they read their poetry, they talk about their life, and they also have drums and flutes, what we call Kavali in Punjabi. So they celebrate that. So this is a more tolerant form of Sufism like Professor said, Sufism itself has seen several graves and diversity. Most of people in subcontinent believed in Sufi traditions of Islam, along with the traditional addicts of Islam, like five prayers a day, give your zakat, go to Hajj, observe your uh, <coughs> fasting in Ramadan, but they also believe this Sufi aspect of it. Currently, there's a great struggle going on, what I call for the heart of Islam in that subcontinent. Because a lot of radical, puritanical Muslim, what we call Wahhabis, have gained, trying to gain upper hand. And that goes along with Taliban you hear every day. And there recently have been several explosions on the occasion of these auras of these celebrations of Sufi saints, whereas the very radical Muslims today consider Sufism 
as out of Islam, so there is a struggle going on to capture the heart of the population. So this is a struggle now going on. If I may add to that, though, um, it is a, we very often are focused on regions that go through conflict, and therefore we see, I mean, what you point to and describe is absolutely true that uh, they're in highly politicized areas, particularly when there is a struggle between East and West or notions, perceptions of East and West. Um, there is this assumption that a kind of tolerant Sufism is more of the Western kind, whereas there could be a more puritanistic, acceptable, quote unquote, correct version, which is the original. But I would say that this is unfortunately because we are so focused on the news of the conflict area. There's one and a half billion Muslims, you know, in, in parts of the world, like in Indonesia, for example, Sufis had a great impact on, on Islam. In India did, in present day uh, Middle East. So I would say that um, the majority are still right in the middle and very much um, the presence of people like Rumi, and by the way, there are very many others like Rumi. We get, happen to know him more than others uh, have, have a great impact, still continue to have a great impact. Very true. Uh, You've entitled this evening an evening of healing. Can you be more specific about what uh, inspiration we can take from, he, from Rumi to accomplish some healing in this divisive atmosphere uh, that we have today in the United States? And not only the inspiration, but how can we apply that inspiration? Well, the, uh, the basic concept of this was uh, that Rumi is one of the most popular poets in America today, and that we have Rumi uh, in our lives, and that this is a strong link between the Muslim, Jewish, and Christian cultures. Individuals appreciate Rumi, and the purpose of this evening, from my viewpoint, and it is, it is, you know, it never becomes exactly what you had visualized, you know, but what I visualized was uh, an evening of healing in that uh, there would be Muslims in the room, there would be Jews in the room, there would be Christians in the room, and they would be sharing an experience, and they would be acutely conscious of the fact that we're all here in this room together, and we're feeling some of the same feelings. Uh, we can talk about uh, philosophies and ideas, but when we get down to the direct experience of, of Rumi, then we, we really connect, you know? And so that's the healing that I visualized. Uh, I don't know how much uh, of a classical, you know, conflict resolution kind of healing uh, we would be experiencing tonight, but uh, as, as I've been listening to, to these incredible people, uh, I am in awe of the fact that, that they seem to feel that just the fact of what we're doing is the healing. We don't have to do anything more than that. And it is, by definition, what we're doing, healing. Uh, thank you, John. I, I just would like to uh, add to that to say that um, if Rumi enables us to touch the human within ourselves and touch at the same time the divine within ourselves, then obviously the purpose has been served and it goes beyond obviously labels such as Jew, Christian and Muslim to go beyond members of all faith traditions, all people of all kinds without any faith tradition if they see themselves and we are here in the uh, ethical society, after all, where, uh, uh, where uh, there is the tradition of secular humanism. And uh, I see the healing in that sense. I think the uh, Rumi is one of those people from within one of these religious traditions that actually uh, 
enable us to really reach within ourselves and touch the human within ourselves. And once we do that, and I think then uh, the, the healing process, uh, for whatever reason or however it will work, has started and uh, will take its own course. <laughs>